Welcome to Emergency First. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like more information about Marinci First, such as service times or ministry opportunities, feel free to check out facebook.com backslash or Marinci First at youtube.com. And two great ways to stay connected throughout the week is by hitting the subscribe button on our YouTube page. That way you'll be notified when something new is posted. And by hitting like on our Facebook page. Thanks again for joining us today. Welcome home. I'm super excited. We're going to talk about a second win today. And here's the deal. I know that life is tough. And I know that there are so many of us that have walked through some battles. You may feel like you're battling right now. But the news is, is God is good. And even in the midst of your struggles, God is good. I forgot to say it, but kids are dismissed. Yeah, uh, she's like, I'm sending you, go. <laughs> go be blessed. I don't know where they're going today, but I know they're going somewhere awesome. So Germany, oh, they're going to Germany. All right, second wind. Any 80s kids out there <laughs> well, I, I, I spent uh, most of my childhood in the 80s. So I, I know three things. I pity the fool. I believe that Eye of the Tiger should be our national anthem. <laughs> and I was a Hulkamaniac. Any Hulkamaniacs? Now, that was back when you could be a Hulkamaniac or you could be, a, because it, it's gotten crazy and off the rails lately. I haven't watched it in probably 20 years, but when I was a kid, I was a Hulkamaniac. And, and I, I remember there was something magical about watching the Hulkster. He'd be in the ring and everybody'd be pounding on him and he'd... You know, they'd be going back and forth, back and forth. He'd be being beat up. And then all of a sudden, it was time to Hulk. He would stand up and you'd get that finger away, baby. You knew something was coming. We were getting ready to bring out the boot. Here comes the elbow or something was about ready to happen because that wave of that finger. It's like once that finger started waving, you could kick him, punch him, slap him. It didn't matter. He was hulking up. He got this second wind of something inside of himself and and you know I was thinking about the hulkster this week and I was thinking about the Holy Spirit that's inside of us and I was thinking that there are times in our life that God just wants us to begin to look at the enemy in the face and begin to shake our finger and say I've had enough and I've had enough of what you're doing and I'm ready for the second wind of the Holy Spirit to begin to rise up within us and say you know what I'm going to conquer you now. And no matter what the enemy is throwing at me, or no matter how much I'm battling, or how scarred I feel, my God is good. Amen. And even in the midst of the battle, we, sometimes you just got to step back and look at it and say, you know, I don't feel it right now, but I know it's true. God is good. You know, I, I don't I always see you working, God, but you're good. All the time. It, 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 there's, there's a part of us that I, I think we've lost. And, and it was something that we tried to talk about at man camp. It's time to grow up and act like a man. But you know, it's also sometimes time to grow up and just become the Christian that God has called us to be. Which means that sometimes you make your mind up. You know, I'm going to worship when it's worship time. I'm going to open my Bible when it's time. Even when I don't feel like it, I'm going to do it. Because I know who my God is. And I know the benefits of it. And I know that if I don't have Jesus on a daily basis I'm lost and my life is falling apart so I'm going to make my mind up that no matter what you throw at me devil I'm going to rise above it I'm going to shout even louder I'm going to dance even harder I'm going to sing even louder and I'm going to quote scripture even more deadly you're going to get it 
There's this fire that has to rise up within us. You know, we've been talking a lot and, and the world is kind of talks, you know, Christians are not supposed to get angry or we're not supposed to have a temper and all that. But, you know, I think there's sometimes that we need to have some holy anger, some holy boldness and begin to say what is right is right and what is wrong is wrong and what we're going to put up with in our own house and what we're going to put up from this and we're going to put up with that and we're tired of it going on. I'm going to tell my mind to get in line with the word of God. I'm going to tell my emotions they're going to submit to the voice of the spirit. I'm going to walk in the grace of God and I'm not going to let the enemy control me. Because I've made my mind up. There's this second wind. And I know right now that there's a lot going on. And you may be feeling a little bit war weary. You know, here's the deal. Satan can't beat you, so he wants to wear you out. He can't overcome you. He wears you out. He's always been that way. Go back to the Garden of Eden. You know, he didn't storm the Garden of Eden with weapons. He snuck in the back door and he asked for permission to take over. Why? Because he had no authority there and he was trespassing. He couldn't storm them and he couldn't take over. So what did he do? He snuck in the back door and he began to take over. What I'm telling you is, is that when the enemy comes to your house, he's also trespassing. So what does he do? He can't storm the castle, so he'll sneak in the back door. And he'll start causing an argument and a fight and a struggle and strife. And he'll start making your mind go crazy. He takes over. But I believe there's a second wind coming. Because I believe God is calling us not to give up, but to fight harder. Look, I think we've lost our message as a church because we've kind of got into the message that the church is going to completely fix the world and everything's going to go great. I've read the Bible. Things get worse. If you're waiting for the things to turn around for you to get happy, you in trouble, bud. If you're waiting for the perfect politician to take over, for everything to turn around. (laughs) I ain't going to finish that one. It's not happening. If you're waiting for some magic bullet that's going to get you out of this mess, it's called the rapture and it's not happened yet. Until then, you're here. And things are getting worse, not better. And I'm here to tell you, it's time that we come to some realizations and say, you know what? I am in a battle. Life is tough. Marriage is worth fighting for. I am under attack. I am under stress. But I can either whine, mope, and complain about it and let the enemy overcome me, or I can rise up and get a second wind of the Holy Spirit and let some fire come inside and say, I'm fighting back. And this is my house. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's right. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Devil, this is my house. And you're not welcomed here. It's time that we realize some things. That we get it deep down inside of our spirit that God has already overcome this world. And if we will allow him to work in us, we will too. But having said that, you're still going to have to live in this world, which means bad things still happen to good people. That means somebody's going to do something wrong to you occasionally. Somebody may even call you a name and hurt your feelings. That's life. Does it feel good? No, it doesn't. Is it something we want to shout about? No, it's not. But it's time that we realize some things because I believe that the enemy has had us so distracted for so long that we've stepped out of the battle. 
I believe that a lot of the reason that we're fighting and we're dealing with what we're dealing with is because we've been so silent, that men have been so silent. There was something special even this morning when our men showed by example, this is how we worship. And they came down front. And guys, keep doing that because we set the example for our homes. We set the example for our kids. You know, a lot of our children don't know how to worship because they've never had someone show them. It's time to change that. It's time that us as men get out of our own comfort zones and say, you know what, I'm uncomfortable doing this. But what I want to pass on to my children and grandchildren is more important than myself. My worship is more important than my comfort zone. Because I want my son and I want my daughter to know when all hell is on their back that how they get out of it is by worshiping their way through it. And they give a second wind and God moves through it. So I'm going to lead that. I'm going to show by example You know, there's somebody else, and that's who we're going to talk about today. And I want you to turn with me to Genesis 37. We're going to talk about Joseph. Most of you know Joseph. But Joseph was a cool dude. But every time something good started happening for Joseph, something bad was right around the corner. If it was bad, it was going to happen to Joseph and you. You know how we feel. If it was bad, it's going to happen to Joseph. Joseph, something starts happening, okay. He's like, man, I got this. And then all of a sudden, there's an enemy there to knock some teeth out. And then it's the next problem. You see, when we read Joseph's story, one thing that we miss is, is we think that it's all like just this simple timeline. You know, one day he's in Potiphar's house, the next day he's in prison, the next day he's in, the next day he's in. No, 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 no. He was years Years. There was years that he was in prison and all he had was a dream that God gave him. And there's some of us here that God has spoken to you, that God has put something in your heart and it's been years. And you feel like, wait, wait a minute. I feel like I'm doing some prison time here. I don't see what God has promised me come in the past. So did Joseph. There are some of us that we feel like we're walking in the midst of the struggle and the trials. And it seems like every time we're doing good, there's always something there to steal the rug out from underneath us. Well, guess what? There is. There is. There's a real enemy that has marked you. There's a real enemy that is out to steal, kill, and destroy. destroy. He's not playing with you. And see, that's the way it was with Joseph. You know, if it was bad, horrible. But there's this message inside of me that I came today to tell you one thing and one thing only. I believe it's time to get a second wind of the Holy Spirit where we shout from the rooftops our victory and let it be the song of praise where the Holy Spirit moves in our life, where there is joy inside of us. You know why it's peace that passes understanding? Because you can't understand it. And the world is looking at you saying, how can you have peace now? Your life is falling apart. How can you have peace now? I can tell that hell is attacking you. But you're like, I don't know how to explain it, but it's a God thing. And there's this peace inside of me that even though the enemy's attacking, I got this. I got this. So let's look at second wind together. Genesis 37, we're going to start with verse number three. Verse number three. All right, it's on the screen. Here we go. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age. 
and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw their father's love, and his father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I had. We were binding sheaves of grain and out in the field when suddenly my sheaf arose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. You know the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told it to his father as well, As his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept these things in mind. Sister Dolores. Génesis 37, del 3 al 11. Y amaba Israel a José más que a todos sus hijos, porque lo había tenido en su vejez. Y le hizo una túnica de diversos colores. Y viendo sus hermanos que su padre lo amaba más, que a todos sus hermanos le aborrecían, y no podían hablarle pacíficamente. Y soñó José un sueño y lo contó a sus hermanos, y ellos llegaron a aborrecerle más todavía. Y él les dijo, oíd ahora este sueño que he soñado. He aquí que atábamos manojos en medio del campo, y he aquí que mi manojo se levantaba y estaba derecho. Y que vos, vuestros manojos estaban alrededor y se inclinaban al mío. Le respondieron sus hermanos, ¿reinarás tú sobre nosotros o señorearás sobre nosotros? Y le aborrecieron aún más a causa de sus sueños y sus palabras. Soñó aún otro sueño y lo contó a sus hermanos diciendo, He aquí que he soñado otro sueño y he aquí que el sol y la luna y once estrellas se inclinaban a mí. Y lo contó a su padre y a sus hermanos. Y su padre le reprendió y le dijo, ¿Qué sueño es este que soñaste? ¿Acaso vendremos yo y tu madre y tus hermanos a postrarnos en tierra ante ti? Y sus hermanos le tenían envidia, mas su padre meditaba en esto. Amén. Amén. Shall we pray? Lord, we ask your blessing upon your word. Lord, I pray that you speak. Holy Spirit, don't let any word be said or done that doesn't bring you honor praise and glory. Lord, I surrender this entire day unto you. Lord, let me preach as one who has authority with the demonstration of power. Let your signs and wonders follow us all the days of our life. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. All right, if you're taking notes, number one, here we go. We need a second wind in how we see ourselves. See ourselves. I love this, the last verse, verse number 10 and 11. It says this, it says that Joseph told the dream and his father said what's this dream that you had are you we really going to bow down to you are you really going to rule over us his father was rebuking him but you know what sticks out to me the most it's not the question but it's the response The very next thing is it says, it says that his brothers walked away jealous, but his father hid it in his heart or or took it to heart or, or did something with it. It meant something to him. And I want you to think about this for a minute. This is a big deal. His father is rebuking him. He's the youngest in the Israelite culture, which means when dad is rebuking you, you listen. He's in the midst of being rebuked by his father and he is getting scolded and his dad is giving him the what for and then all of a 
sudden his dad asks him a question and then the response is incredible. His dad walks away hiding it in his heart. So here's the deal. If he would have said, you're right, dad. As the youngest, I, 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 that, that's foolish. It's just a dream. I will follow you. Would his dad have hidden it in his heart and his brothers walked away jealous? Absolutely not. So you know what I believe? I believe that Joseph had an encounter with God. And even in the midst of his father's rebuke, Joseph knew who he was. And Joseph had to respond something to his father so straightforward, so pointed that his father walks away hiding it in his heart. What I'm here to tell you is, is we need a new revelation, a second wind of who we are in the father. Because I'm here to tell you, I am a somebody and so are you. We need to get a new revelation, a second wind on who I am. You see, Joseph had an encounter with God, and he knew who he was. There's so many of us that we have forgotten who our father is. There's so many of us that walk through this life forgetting that we are the king's children, and the enemy is trespassing in our lives and we put up with things that we're not called to put up with we listen to voices we're not called to listen to and we allow things to affect us that have no right and power over us and we start letting things that God has given us control over begin to control us you know one of the saddest things in history is where something you've been giving control over begins to control you and there are so many of us that if we were honest we're battling with thoughts we're battling with feelings we're battling with emotions we're battling with identity and you hear me talk about identity all the time because, church, I believe that most of our problem comes back to the fact that we have forgotten who our God is and we've forgotten who we are inside of him and we've allowed too many outside voices to play in our own heads. Most of the time, our fear and our depression, our anxiety, and all of the stuff that controls us goes back to our, the lack of our understanding of who we are. We've lost this identity thing. And Joseph had it. His dad was like, how dare you? Who do you think you are? But something inside of Joseph said, Dad, I'm sorry in all due respect, but I know who I am. And God has put a dream in my heart. And I don't care how big the giant is. And I don't care how big you are, devil. And I don't care what you throw my way. There's a dream in my heart that won't quit, that won't die, that won't lay down. Because I'm going to see my family make it. I'm going to see my family worship the Lord. There are some of you that are praying for the salvation of your family. And all the enemy wants to show you is how things are getting worse. You want to make your family get worse at the very beginning? Start praying for them to get saved. It's, it's just the way it works. Why? Because when you start praying in the spirit that God will save your family, the enemy knows that God is at work. So what does he do? He tries to mess it up. So sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. But what do we do? We stay the course. You see, Joseph said, hey, wait a minute. And I'll do respect, Dad. I've had an encounter with God. And it really doesn't matter what the opposition is. It really doesn't matter what the doctor says. It really doesn't matter what my bank account says. It really doesn't matter about what somebody tells me. It really doesn't matter about the naysayers or the reports. It really doesn't matter about the rumors. It really doesn't matter about any of that because I've had an encounter with God. And I know what God says about me. And I know I'm the apple of his eye. So I don't really care what someone else has said. I don't really care what my mom and dad even spoke over my life because I am a father's child. 
And my dad says that I am the apple of his eye. You know, there are so many that come to speak for counseling and to speak about different issues. And so much of it goes back to something that their family spoke into them. So many of us can't overcome that where a father was, you'll never account anything or you'll never be anything. And it, it gets so rooted inside of us. But that's why we need a second wind of identity. Look, I'm not who I was. I am new now. And my new father, my real father, says that I am good. He says that I am made it. He says that I am worthy. He says that I am redeemed. He says that I am forgiven. And my father says that he made no junk. So I don't care what anybody said to me. And I don't care what you think. All I know is that my father said that I can get it done. And I'm going to conquer it. You see, that was the tenacity of Joseph. The tenacity of Joseph that shut down the enemy. His dad was in the midst of rebuking him. But after Joseph got a glimpse of who he was, all that happened was his dad walked away. Hiding it in his heart because there was something said that struck him that, hey, wait a minute, there's an element of truth here. I can't argue with that because when someone's in the presence of the Lord, the enemy has to back off. Yeah. Can't argue with that. I am a somebody. Number two, a second win on God's promises. There's a, a very powerful verse that Joseph says here. I'm not going to pretend that Joseph's life was easy. We know it wasn't. Joseph is the poster boy for all-out wreck. From whether you, we all know that it was an attack and we all know that God allowed it to happen so that he could move him where he needed to be for the salvation of others. But on the front of it, it looks like this dude has some bad luck. This dude is something, this is a sinner, something's going on. This guy is something strange here. So I'm not going to sit here and pretend that Joseph wasn't walking through hell because he was. But there's an awesome verse here. Verse number six. You see, even in the midst of prison, this is what he said to them. He said, listen to this dream that I had. You want to know how Joseph made it through years of prison? Listen to this dream that I have. You know how you and I as believers overcome the daily muck of the daily life? Listen to this dream that I have. Listen to the promises of my Lord. I know he's coming soon. I know his reward is with him. I know that this is not my home. Listen to this dream that I have. Listen to what God has spoken into your life. But take his promises and let them begin to speak into you. Joseph's like, hey, I don't care about the prison. Because listen to the dream. Listen to the promises. You and I. It's time we get a second wind over the promises of the Lord. Because I'm here to tell you that God is still a healer. You know, last week I asked everyone, if God has done something in your life, to write it on the back of your connection card. And you know how many connection cards we got back with somebody writing something on the back of them where God has done something. I'm here to tell you, God's still the healer. And some of you guys that wrote God is the healer, I want to get up with you because I want to get some testimonies out of you. We want to get to, look, God's moving. And it's the faith and hearing that someone else was here. Hey, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. God's the healer. There were those that said, hey, wait a minute. God, God has delivered me from some addictions. Hey, God's the healer. God is moving. There's the promises. And I'm here to tell you every Sunday, look, hold on to the truths of God. 
there's these bumpers. I don't know if you've ever been bowling with a kid and they put up the bumpers. You know what the bumpers do? The bumpers keep the ball rolling down the lane. It doesn't matter how nasty the ball is rolled, but it rolls down the lane. Yeah, that's what the truths of God are. There are bumpers. You may bounce back and forth, but it keeps you moving down the lane. His promises. God's a healer. God's a deliverer. God's a forgiver. God sets free. Listen to this dream that I have. God still speaks. And if he can do it for others, he can do it for you. So what am I telling you? Look, don't give up. Don't give up. If anybody had an impossible situation, it was Joseph. But every time it looked impossible, Joseph had an answer for it. Listen to this dream that I had. You see, every time the enemy wants to make your life look impossible, every time the enemy wants to tell you that you're not going to win, will you begin to remind him, listen to this dream that I have. Listen to what the word says. Listen, I am an overcomer. Therefore, now there is what? No condemnation through Christ Jesus. So I don't care what my past was. I only care what God's going to do in my future. So I'm walking past all of that. I'm not my own. I'm bought at a price. And I'm a Holy Ghost filled man. And I'm not going to listen to it. I fight back by the promises that I have. Because all of God's promises are yes and amen. Joseph said, listen to this dream. Listen to this dream. There's some of us that need to rise up and we need to get that as a mantra. You need to write it on your forehead. This is Marenzi. We tattoo everything else. You might as well tattoo that. Listen to this dream. Listen to this dream. These promises. Number three. Listen. When God puts a dream in your heart, begin to look for cisterns. I'm sure you know what a cistern is. If you don't, it's a a deep pit that water collects in it so that people can have water. But I want to tell you something. The enemy is jealous of the dreams God has placed in your life. The call God has placed in your life. When God breathes a dream over you in your heart, you always have an enemy that's going to be right there at that moment to test your mettle. I tell everybody, look, if I have an opportunity to talk to somebody after I prayed for them, the first thing I want to tell them is, look, the enemy will try to test what God is doing here. So when you go home, you be prepared that you may feel something. You may feel a pain. Uh Uh-uh, I was healed. Uh Uh-uh. Because there's always going to be an enemy there to try to put you back in a cistern. When God puts a dream in your heart, when God begins to move, there's always going to be an enemy there to test your mettle. To see, did you get it? Did it really happen? And that's the thing with like man camp. And what I keep stressing is, look, we want six months from now the same thing but better than what's going on right now. Because what is the worst is you go and you get fired up and then three months later you forget what you're even fired up about. But you know how you keep that? You keep the dream alive. You keep reminding yourself, listen to this dream that I have. And I know that God has given me a dream. So I understand that there's some cisterns that are probably being planned for me. I know that there's an enemy out there that has marked me and going to try to push me into the hole. Going to try to steal what God is doing. And 
life in. You know, I, I spent most of my childhood in the 80s and we had He-Man and Rocky on rerun, you know, rewind. We were, we, but life is not, man, I, I wish, man, I wish every time the enemy was on me and I felt like I was about ready to be defeated, all of a sudden I wish they would go, dun, 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 you know, wouldn't that be awesome? All of a sudden, you know, you'd hulk up. Not going to tell on myself, but when it's family clean day around the house, we, we get ourselves motivated by hulking up to the eye of the tiger. <laughs> but life is really not like that. When the enemy is attacking and you're down and out, all of a sudden there, there's not this music going to come out of the sky and there, there's not something going to change. Our strength has to come back from the Lord. You're going to have to dig deep and reach out. God will move in your situation if you allow him to, but your strength has to come from him, from the dream that he's placed in you. And what I mean by dreams are the promises that he's made you. The, the word that he's given us. The promises of heaven. You know, there's some of us that have lost family members. And you know what we rejoice in? That to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And this same Jesus that you see going away will one day come back for you. That's what we rejoice in. We stand on the promises. Knowing that when a promise is made that a cistern is built. Life is not a Rocky movie. You got to dig deep and grab a hold of God's promises. But you are a highly trained soldier of the living God. And God has anointed you. Jesus said, hey, it's better that I go away because I'm going to send one as myself unto you, the Holy Spirit. And he's not only going to lead you into all truth, but he's going to empower you to conquer all things. It's amazing. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit yet, do it. Seek it. Your power comes through it. Then number four and final, doing good, doing bad. Look, I'm not going to read it. We've read it. I can read this whole passage again. But you know the cycle. Every time you catch a break or things begin to look up, the carpet gets pulled out. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you can raise your heart. Have you ever felt that way? Sometimes I got to raise both hands and both feet and stand on my tiptoes. I felt that way. You know, every incident with Joseph began with a, I tell you, I, I, Joseph's life is interesting. You know, every event that began with Joseph began with a blessing of God. You know, God began to bless Joseph at Potiphar's house, and then he gets accused of rape. God begins to bless Joseph here, and then everything is almost like, okay, God, no more. It's I'm good. Okay. Forget you know me until the end. But it's like everything that could go wrong went wrong. And most of it started with some kind of blessing from God. You know, God gives him a dream. God blesses Potiphar on and on and on. It all went bad. But listen to me very closely. If it wasn't for the slavery, there would never have been a Potiphar's house. And if there was never a Potiphar's house, there would have never been a prison. If there was never a prison, there would have never have been your salvation. There would have never have been the nation Israel. 
You see, even through the midst of everything, and I love what Joseph ends this with. He says, hey, wait a minute. His brothers are terrified. He's going to kill me now. Dad is dead. We're dead. And Joseph made the one of the most powerful statements that you can make. He said, wait a minute. You don't understand. That even when it didn't seem like he was working, he was. I didn't always get it in the prison cell, but I had the dream. I didn't really understand it when I was in Potiphar's house and I was doing what was right. And I thought, man, if you do what is right and you serve God and you do your very best, you know, things should go all right. Why did it go bad? I didn't get it. But there was a dream inside of me that wouldn't quit. But now, standing here today, I understand That what the enemy meant for my destruction, God is turning it around for my good. And I'm going to shout it out one day, listen to this dream that I had. Because God has turned it around. And God has taken the bad and made it good. And look at the salvation of everyone. So you don't have to worry about me killing you, brothers. Because what you meant for evil, God was in it the whole time. And God has turned it around for good. And what I'm telling you is, is there's some of you that may have to do some jail stints. And you're walking through life and you're doing good and then you're doing bad. And you're just moving through this thing. And all of the time you're saying, okay, God, I don't get it. I, I'm trying my very best. I'm paying my tithe. I'm praying. I'm going to pray. I'm doing everything you asked me to do. And yet, I don't see anything but giants. And God's up in heaven saying, hold on. Hold on to the dream. Because you're going to come out on the other side. And one day I'm going to move you from the prison to the palace. One day I'm going to take you out of here and one day you're going to go from the prison house to the palace house and you're going to see me bless you more than anything can be put back together. I'm going to do something so amazing in your life that you're going to be so filled with joy that no one's going to be able to hold you down. I'm going to turn it around. Doing good, doing bad. So part of life, three feet forward, four feet back. A lot of times when a blessing comes, you know there's an enemy there to test your metal. You hear me pray it all the time, and I would encourage you to. I pray it every day, all the time. Lord, keep me humble that I never have to be humbled. Lord, keep me humble that I never have to be humbled. Because I'd rather be on your altar dealing with you than dealing with pride and other stuff. Because you're a wise, good judge, and I am in your hands. Keep me humble. This past Friday, as you know, my wife and I try to do a date night. Guys, take your wife on a date night, it's awesome. Keep the fire alive. Healthy marriage, healthy family. Better parents, better people. We were on our date night Friday night, and I had to work late, so it was later in the evening. So, uh, but we had to run by the dollar store, and they were just getting ready to close. So she ran into the store and was coming out, and a lady and and man flew into the parking lot, and the lady jumped out and was running to the to the thing. Well, it was ten o'clock, and they wouldn't let her in. And my wife heard her yell, and I'm not trying to embarrass her. She's not here, but it's a part of life. She's like, I just need tampons. I have daughters. You have wife. We've been there, yes. I've done tampon runs, you know. It happens. Anyway, she's like, I just need tampons. They're like, I'm sorry, we're closed. So my wife, with her baggage, she's she's like, I just, not to embarrass you, but I think I just heard you say I need tampons. I I actually have some in the car. If, if, you know, I've been there, you know, hey, been there. So my wife's going through her purse, pulling out four or five tampons, you know, to give it to this lady. And she's super excited. And, you know, her husband or whatever, he's, you know, blushing, you know, you know how it goes, you know. 
For me, I don't personally care. I'm the one that's stuck buying those jokers. You know, whatever. So it is what it is. So anyway, he's kind of blushing. And, you know, she's giving her the tampon. And then, you know, I, my wife kind of noticed that he's kind of blushing. So she's like, you know, hey, do I need to, you know, she kind of like secretly, you know, so he's not freaked out, you know, kind of like secretly handed them to him, you know, kind of thing. Anyway, we just noticed that, you know, she's kind of like secretly handing these tampons to this woman and she grabs them, kind of runs back to her car, but, you know, kind of high, you know, and no one's like flowing them in the air. Look at the tampon they have, you know, it's kind of like the secret thing, you know. Anyway, we noticed that this cop drives by. Well, you know, no big deal, whatever. <laughs> so... He's in front of us coming this way, like, you know, coming up to the Marinci air. Well, we pull out, you know, whatever. All of a sudden, he pulls over the side of the road. Now, he's in front of us, not behind us. We're not doing anything anyway, but we're behind him. So he just pulls over. Okay, we see cops pull over all the time over there. Well, as soon as we pass him, he pulls right out behind us, and he's following, like, right on your butt side, you know, right there. So you know that it's like, okay, he was in front of me, so I wasn't speeding. I didn't do any. What's the deal, you know? It's like, we must look guilty or something sitting in bash. I don't know. Anyway, so, yes, we're going, and Hidden's like, well, he hasn't turned the lights on yet, but he's following us super, super close. Something's off here. You know, you get that feeling, you know. So all of a sudden, his lights go on, so we pull over, and like, this is nuts. So he, he walks up to the car, and, you know, of course, very, yes, sir, you know, you know you, we respect our police, etc. And... You know, but I, but I had to ask, I was like, is something wrong? You know, it's like, he was in front of, you know, I mean, nothing happened. And, and you know, um, so he comes up with a, an excuse. He's like, uh, well, the, the license plate, and, you know, it's like, uh, so he's like, the license plate is out of date. And I was like, okay, well, he didn't know that until he pulled up. Basically, we just got it. We ordered a new one. We had it in the car. It just came. So I was like, oh, great. I have it right here. Just came, picked it up from the mailbox, still in the pack. You know, he's like, oh, okay. So... He walks back, and he comes back, and he's like, well, no big deal here. You know, everything was good because we didn't do anything wrong anyway. So my wife's like, I know what happened. When he drove by, he saw me sneaking this, and they were hunting. He's like, these people are drug dealers in the middle of a dollar store. Because that joker was driving ahead of us and decided, it's like he looked in the rear view mirror, and he's like, I'm going to pull them over for no reason, you know. But it's because he saw, and it's like, no matter how good you're doing, <laughs> But I had to chuckle because I was in, you know, I, I already wrote this message. I was thinking, uh-huh, there we go, doing something good. And there, <laughs> but that's the way it works. It's like, no matter how you're trying to do your life, no matter how much you're trying, you know, it's like you, you give and, and it seems like the more you give, the more something breaks or, you know, it's like, that's the way life is. That's the way Joseph's life was. But the thing that we're forgetting along the way is, is there's a purpose in things. You're not your own. You have been bought at a price. There's a God in heaven that has numbered the hairs on your head. So it's time that we get out of ourselves. It's time we get away from the pity parties and start saying, I am a child of God. And I know that my father has whatever I'm going through. And one day he's going to take me from the prison cell to the palace. And it's time that we start shouting it out. Listen to this dream that I have. So anytime, look, some rude customer comes in your shop. Listen to this dream that I have. Somebody says something to you. Listen to this dream that I have. Because it's a mantra in my heart. Because it's life. That's what Joseph did. How did he make it from the Potiphar all the way through? Listen to this dream that I have. See, it's time, church. It's time for some second wind inside of you that rises up with expectation and understanding where someone says, I am a somebody through Christ Jesus, and I don't have to put up with this anymore. Where we begin to not make excuses, where we begin to make 
ways to get out of the pits that we're in. Look, if you're dealing with some kind of emotional issue or whatever else, look, recognize what the enemy is doing in your life and fight back. Look, there is freedom in Christ Jesus. I'm not my own. I belong to Jesus. And it's time that you and I, look, this is not my marriage. This is God. He's given this. to I put him first. So I'm going to let him make me through this. Fight back. Because if it wasn't for slavery, there would never have been an Israel. I don't know where God has taken you, but he's taken you somewhere. And you don't know who along the journey God is using you to speak into someone's life. And you don't know where when you get to where you're going, what God has going to do in your aftermath. You know, the worst part of a hurricane is the aftermath. It's not the eye, it's what comes after it. And the best part of your life is going to be the aftermath of where you've been and what you've been through. Where you can say, I know where I was, but I know where I am. And what the enemy meant for my destruction and what happened to me back there is no bearing on what's happening to me right now. I want you to bow your heads with me. Because I believe that God is speaking to you. And I believe that God wants to speak to your heart. And I believe that he wants to begin to rise up within you. And he's calling you to get a second wind and to understand your identity in him, to understand who you are, but more importantly, to understand who he is through you and in you and that he's constantly working it out. And I don't care if you feel like you're in the jail cell, one day the palace is coming. You just keep holding on to the promises. You keep holding on to the dream. Because what God has promised you, he will bring it to pass. But if you get your eyes off and you start looking at the jail cell and you start looking at the wardens and you start looking at the convicts and you start looking at the pain and you start looking at all the other stuff, you know what you're going to see? Nothing but pain and struggle and trials and it's going to steal the joy of your life. And it's also going to steal your destiny because you're going to give up before you get to where you're going. I would love to stand up here and say, give it six months and everything's going to turn rosy in our world. It's not going to happen. You think people are rude now? They're going to keep getting ruder. But you, bride of Christ, you mighty warrior, you're different. Because you're not of this world. You may be in it, but you're not of it. And your hope doesn't come from this world. Your joy doesn't come from this world. Your peace doesn't come from this world. Your strength doesn't come from this world. Since it doesn't come from this world, this world can't take it from you. You know what takes it from you? Most of the time, you. You allow the enemy to steal what he has no right to. So you're going to have to make your mind up. Are you going to stand? Or are you going to cower? Some of you today need to stand up and you need to take the Hulkamania red and you need to take your finger and begin to wave it around to your problems and your mindsets and some of your attitudes and some of the things that you're going through. Some of you need to take your finger and you need to start waving it in the face of your own emotions and your own feelings and some of the problems that you've been dealing with and you need to start telling it no more. I'm hulking up in the Holy Spirit and I'm taking you down. 
I'm not putting up with this anymore. I don't care how big you say you are, and I don't care how much power you think you have. You don't have anything on me because I don't belong to this world. So I'm going to ask Lance to come back.